Hello and welcome to the Hanseatic League, a podcast by the history of the Germans. Episode 14, Calamitous Victories. In 1435, the Hanse can look back at a string of successes. Another war with Denmark won. The patrician regime in Lübeck and elsewhere restored. Conflict with Burgundy and England settled in their favour. But, as Winston Churchill once remarked, the problem of victory are more agreeable than those of defeat, but they are no less difficult. And these problems are raising their ugly heads. Now, before we start, just a quick reminder that you are listening to an advertising-free podcast, which means all this effort is ultimately funded by my lovely patrons. Patrons are people who are incredibly generous, not just towards me, but towards all of you listeners out there. They keep this old cock sailing, and we are all very grateful to them. And as you may know by now, you can join this illustrious group by going on to patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or my website, historyofthegermans.com slash support. And you get access to bonus episodes and other privileges for the price of a chocolate croissant per month. And there you can join Daniel C., Jim T.W., Karim C., and Mark W., who've already signed up. And another thing I wanted to highlight is that I've now introduced a search function on the History of the Germans website. The website contains not just maps and book recommendations, but also the transcripts of all episodes ever published. And they are now searchable. If you are so inclined, you can find all mentions of the city of Magdeburg, the county of Holstein, or find out where I talk about the Empress Matilda, etc., etc., all at the click of a button. And bear with it, please, it's not as sophisticated a search tool as Google, but it should help you find things you're particularly interested in, or if you want to re-listen to an episode that's stuck in your mind and simply cannot find it, go to the search engine on historyofthegermans.com and check it out. Now, last week, we talked about the constitutional crisis of 1406-18, to when the city of Lübeck was incapacitated by tensions between the ruling patricians and the upper middle class and the artisans. The old leadership emerged victorious from the conflict, leaving the city council as dominated by the wealthy as it had been before. Though the uprising had failed, the conflict still left a mark on the Hanse. The patrician, who had defended their position in many of the member cities, agreed to make the Hanse an instrument in the preservation of their power. The Diet of 1418 instituted the right of the League to interfere in the internal affairs of the cities, specifically to expel any city that had overthrown their patrician rulers. Merchants who wanted to partake in the Hanse privileges now had to prove that they were the residents of a current member city, not just that they were from the Holy Roman Empire. With that, the Hanseatic League moves one step further on its trajectory from a largely voluntary association driven by mercantile interests to a more structured political entity. Though it's still a long, long way from a league of cities with its own institutions, bureaucracy and army. Proposals by Lübeck to go down that route had been rejected. Lübeck, though still not the capital of the Hanse, still became its general secretariat. Most Hanseatic diets took place in the city on the Trava River, the city council maintained the Hanseatic archives and disputes between members of the Hanse were settled here. And most importantly, Lübeck was in charge of the agenda of the Hanseatic diets. The diets were in parliamentary debates as we know them, where, at least in principle, the members could change their minds. The delegates of the different cities usually arrived with explicit and detailed instructions from their hometowns. And these instructions were based on the agenda and the proposal set out in the invitation, which was drafted by the City Council of Lübeck. So the cities who received this agenda were in practice limited to a yes-no decision on the proposals from the Baltic shore. If they had an alternative proposal, they were perfectly free to send their delegate to initiate a debate at the Diet. But the alternative proposal could not really be agreed upon on that same Diet because few of the other delegates had discussed it with their councils back home beforehand, so they did not have the power to vote on it. So even if the majority of delegates agreed with an alternative proposal, these would still have to go back to their hometowns for ratification. Therefore, in the interest of time, 
the Diet usually went with the Lübeck proposal. Another constraint was that very few of the 70 plus members and 200 associate members actually went to the Hanseatic Diet. It was usually just the most important ones and those with a strong interest in the matter at hand who shouldered the expense of sending a delegation. The smaller cities left their representation to the large cities who led their regional Hanse Association. These were Cologne for the Rhenish cities, Brunswick for the Saxon ones, Gdansk for the Prussian and Westphalian ones, and Lübeck for the Wendish cities. Other regular attendees were Rostock, Wismar, Stralsund, Magdeburg, Hamburg, Bremen and Lüneburg. Usually there were only about a dozen delegates. Even the important diet of 1418 counted only 35 participants, which still made it one of the largest gatherings on record. Now this setup put Lübeck very much into the driver's seat and mostly they made proposals that benefited all of the cities. The Hanseatic Diet spent a lot of the 15th century standardizing and simplifying the laws of commerce. Rules about shipping, contracts, sharing of risks and the like are very much in line with the main purpose of the effort, removing barriers to trade. So the city fathers were serious about making the Hanse a success, but in the end, the shirt is closer than the jacket. When interests diverged, the interests of Lübeck was the one that prevailed. It did not take long after 1418 for that imbalance in the system to become apparent. The issue that brings it out in the open goes back to 1370 and the Peace of Stralsund. The victorious Hansards were given not just the fortresses on the Öresund for a period of 15 years, but also effective control of the great herring market in Scania for an indeterminate period. The Hanse used these powers to expel their Dutch and English competitors from Falsterbö and Skerner. And as you may remember, the herring market was much more than a market for herring. Traders came from all over to sell their wares, cloth from Flanders and England, spices and luxury items from Italy, fur and beeswax from the north, grain and wood from Prussia and Livonia, everything and anything was traded there. But when the English and the Dutch were banned from the fair, their cloth and their spices did not get there. Hanse merchants, who might have bought them there in Scania, now picked up these wares in London and Bruges directly. Within a short period of time, the once huge fair was reduced to just a fish market. An enormous fish market, but just a fish market. The ban from the herring market had an obviously detrimental effect on the Dutch and the English, they still wanted to trade in salted fish, grain, beeswax and the like. So, once the Öresund was open again, they sailed past Scania all the way to the source of these goodies, to Livonia and to Prussia. They also found a solution to the exclusion from the fish market itself. The Dutch started fishing for Atlantic herring on the Dogger Bank. Atlantic herring may be less desirable than the Baltic subspecies, but in the end, it came down to price and availability. Atlantic herring was cheaper and available, whilst Baltic herring became quite expensive and was no longer as abundant as it had once been. The gradual cooling of the sea and more importantly the intense overfishing of herring who had not yet spawned led to a gradual decline in the stock of Baltic herring. There were widely divergent views amongst the cities of the Hanse on how to address this issue of intensifying competition on their doorstep. Some saw opportunities in working with the newcomers, whilst others argued for more protectionist policies. The Livonian and the Prussian cities initially preferred a collaborative approach, granting the English and Dutch traders a place at the table, even admitting some to the Artushof. But when the English abused the hospitality granted, Gdansk expelled them. But the Prussians and Gdansk in particular kept a close relationship with the Low Countries where they sold a lot of their wood, ash and grain. Lübeck and the Wendish cities were more consistently protectionist against both the Dutch and the English, but they were more open to admitting southern Germans. Protectionist measures usually included a blanket ban for foreigners to trade with other foreigners, a ban on contacting the producers directly, the strict enforcement of the staple rights, and the prohibition of joint companies between Hansards and foreign merchants. Now, things got more heated when war with Denmark breaks out again. 
In the meantime, the great Margaret had passed and her successor was Eric of Pomerania, a much less accomplished political operator. Now, Eric had supported the patrician old council in the constitutional crisis and had therefore expected the grateful senators to return the favour by helping him in his conflict with the Counts of Holstein. The Counts of Holstein, as you may remember, had become Dukes of Schleswig as vassals of the Danish crown. And as it happened, they weren't exactly as faithful a vassal as the Danish king would have liked. Or maybe the king simply just wanted Schleswig back, full stop. Now the Lübeck patricians weren't quite so convinced that they owed that much to Eric. Their primary concern was to keep the land and river route between Lübeck and Hamburg open. Remember that they had just spent vast amounts of money on the Stecknitz Canal that provided a direct shipping connection between the Baltic and the North Sea. And that money had been the trigger for the civil discontent that had nearly brought the Hanse to the brink of extinction. No way they would risk a war with the Count of Holstein, whose lands lay between the two cities and who could cut the connection any time he wanted. Eric was, to say the least, a bit disappointed. And he was the sort of man who did not like to be disappointed. He retaliated by inviting the Dutch and the English to trade with his vast territory, which included not just Denmark, but also Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Finland, Faroe and Shetland. He also supported the Poles and Lithuanians in their struggle with the Teutonic Knights. Now, at the risk of spoiling the next season, I have to mention here that at the Battle of Tannenberg in 1410, many knights had fallen, including their Grand Master Ulrich von Jungingen. And even though they negotiated a favourable peace treaty afterwards, the Teutonic Knights were no longer the force they had once been. In the subsequent decades, they would lose more territory to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, including the city of Danzig, or Gdansk. And then, Eric introduced a new toll for passing through the Ersund, and that was a serious impairment to the Hanse trade. The Bürgermeister of Lübeck, Joran Plesko, who was the same who had engineered the return of patrician rule to the city, was able to maintain the peace, despite these constant provocations. But once he had died, the hawks on the city council got their way. The Wendish cities declared war on Denmark and closed the Öresund in 1425. They quickly realized why their shrewd old Bürgermeister had counseled against war. Only the Wendish and the Pomeranian cities were prepared to support the effort. The Prussian and Livonian cities, in particular Danzig, Riga and Tallinn, were outraged by the blockade. The reason was economic, which should not be surprising in an association run by merchants. There were only two trade routes to ship goods out of the Baltic. One was the land route between Lübeck and Hamburg. The other was via the Öresund and then around Jutland. The route via the Öresund had gained in importance as time went by. The grain, the wood, the ash that made up the majority of the exports from Prussia and Livonia was extremely bulky. As a consequence, their ships got bigger and bigger. Unloading them in Lübeck and then putting the wares on a smaller vessel to go via the Stecknitz Canal and the Elbe River to Hamburg and then reloading them onto another ship there was very expensive and time-consuming. So expensive and so time-consuming that the route through the Sund and around the tip of Jutland became more and more attractive, even if it involved spending days in harbour waiting for fair winds. Gdansk, Riga and Tallinn and many other cities on the northern end of the Baltic were now shipping their goods through the Öresund and around Jutland. A war with Denmark closed that route and forced them to use the Lübeck route. Now, on top of that, Eric's provocation was much less harmful to the Prussian and Livonian cities. They did not mind the Dutch and the English as much as the Lübecker. And the war against the Teutonic Order was even welcome to an extent, since the Knights had suppressed city freedoms and had a commercial operation that competed directly with the merchants. Renewed war with Denmark was therefore a blow to the trade of Danzig, Riga, Reval, Elbing, Torn, etc a blow that they could have accepted had it been for the purposes they supported. But, as things stood, 
it looked almost as if Lübeck was trying to restore its overstretched finances by provoking a war that forced their fellow Hansards to use their harbour and their canal. Now things weren't help and the Hansa fleet was beaten by the Danes. The fleet had protected a large convoy of ships coming with salt from Bourneuf, destined for Prussia. Now that salt was now filling the Danish barrels that went to London and Bruges on Dutch and English ships. News of the disaster were badly received at home. The population blamed the recently reinstalled patrician governments in Wismar, Rostock and Hamburg for the failure. And hats rolled. The war went on in this manner for nine long years, during which the Prussians and Livonians grudgingly paid their fellow Hansards for services they did not want to use in the first place. And by the way, because the cheap salt did not get through from Bourneuf, everyone had to buy the expensive salt from Lüneburg, adding to the frustration. But it gets better. The Wendish cities did win their war, not thanks to their naval prowess, but thanks to Eric's total incompetence. His long war with Holstein and the lack of sensitivity towards the interests of his different kingdoms had left him in an increasingly precarious situation. In 1434, Engelbrecht Engelbrechtsson, a mine owner of probably German extraction, held a rebellion of Swedish peasants against what they believed was Danish overreach within the kingdom. The rebellion forced Eric not only to make wide-ranging concessions to his Swedish subjects, but also to end the costly war with Holstein and the Hansards. The Counts of Holstein were confirmed as Dukes of Schleswig, and the Wendish cities were confirmed in their extensive privileges in Scania and elsewhere. Now these privileges included now also a relief from paying the recently introduced toll for the use of the Öresund. Now this later exemption only applied to the Wendish cities who had fought the war with Eric, meaning that the Prussians and Livonians still had to pay it, forcing them to still use the Lübeck to Hamburg route. Now, if that was at all possible, the next leg makes things even worse for the traders from Gdansk, Riga and Tallinn. In 1438, King Eric is deposed in Denmark because of his failures in war, general incompetence and debauchery. The Danish Royal Council then offered the crown to the last descendant of Waldemar IV, Christian, the Count Palatinate, a German imperial prince they called Christian of Bavaria. Christian knew nothing about Scandinavia and was supposed to be a puppet monarch whose impressive titles belied a rather weak position. The Wendish cities on whose support he had relied were given further privileges and the castle of Helsingur. Lübeck used that to completely block the Dutch from entering the Baltic. With that, the Wendish cities had cut them off from their preferred trading route and their business partners in Holland. When the Prussian cities claim that Lübeck is acting mainly in its own interest rather than in the interest of all Hansards, well, they do have a point. And Hansa solidarity starts breaking down in other areas as well. The trade in grain in Livonia kept growing, with a growing demand from the low countries. Much of that trade was going through foreign merchants, Dutch and southern Germans in particular. But they overstretched it. They started buying the wares directly from the owners of the states until the Council of Riga had enough. The council banned anyone, not just the Dutch and the southerners, but also their fellow Hansards from buying directly from the producers. That hurt the Lübeck traders hard and they went to the Teutonic Knights who ruled Livonia and asked them for help against this obstinate city. That was a serious breach of protocol. Asking a non-Hanseatic power to solve an internal Hanseatic conflict was an admission that the association was no longer able to adjudicate its own affairs. Riga retaliated by confiscating all Lübeck assets in its harbour. The conflict remained unresolved and Riga persisted with its strict protectionism. Having such a rift between the Livonian cities and Lübeck was not helpful when the contour in Novgorod got into hot water. In 1424, 150 German merchants were incarcerated as retaliation for what the authorities believed was an act of piracy committed by Hansards on Russian ships. 36 of these merchants died in prison. Ownership of the contour was restored to the Hansards eventually, but 
less and less merchants were willing to take the risk of suddenly getting locked up and then rotting away in some boyar's jail, just for some squirrel pelts. Gradually, it was solely the Livonians who came down and they took control of the contour and squeezed out whatever was left. In 1471, Ivan the Great, the ruler of the Principality of Moscovy and grandfather of the much more famous Ivan the Terrible, conquered Novgorod. He had no liking for foreigners in general and more importantly wanted to shift trade to his own territory around Moscow. Lübeck and the other Hansards saw little reason to come to the protectionist Livonians' aid, and so the contour was closed. Over the coming century, the trade in furs shifted away from the Baltic route to the land route that ended in Leipzig, where a great fair had been established by the Wettiner Markgrafs of Meissen in 1165 and 1268. So if you want to know more about that, episode 107 is when we talk about the Wettiner's policy in Meissen. Another contour that got hurt in this Hanse infighting was Bergen. Here Lübeck, Rostock and Wismar took sole control in 1446. That led the other Hanseatic cities, including the Dutch members of the League, to start bypassing Bergen and procure stockfish directly from Iceland and elsewhere. And in London, the situation was even more complex. London was the place where two main Hanse trading routes came together. The east-west route from the Baltic, bringing fish, grain, beeswax and wood, and the south-north route, bringing wine from the Rhine Valley and increasingly from France into England. Traders on these two routes did have little in common. And as you may remember, there used to be multiple contours in England, one for the Cologne merchants, which was in London, and then multiple others for the Easterlings. Things got difficult when the Wendish, Prussian and Livonian cities find themselves in conflict with the King of England. The source of this conflict is the issue of reciprocity. The English merchants are irritated that their German counterparts can trade more or less freely in England, while they face all sorts of obstacles when they try to get into the Baltic. And it sounds fair enough, and the English kings, when they are not preoccupied with the Hundred Years' War or the War of the Roses, are giving their support to the merchant adventurers. Support that goes as far as capturing a fleet of nearly 100 Hanseatic ships, which results in a declaration of war. Lübeck is again the most bellicose and the most intransigent war but there is some support from the Prussian cities on this one. And this is, by the way, the same war during which the privateer Paul Benecke captured the galley of Tommaso Portinari that we talked about in episode 118. Now the ones who have no stake in this game and would very much prefer to remain neutral are the merchants of Cologne. They have been welcoming English traders for centuries and they have close links back to the days of Emperor Henry V and the Empress Matilda, if not beyond. Still, their fellow Hansards insist that Cologne, even if they are not willing to fight alongside them, should at least join the trade embargo against England. But that is too much for Cologne. On balance, Cologne decided that membership in the Hansa is not worth cutting the trade connections with England. In 1471, the city of Cologne, one of the four leading cities of the Hansa, is excluded. This war between England and the Hansa lasted three years and was sort of intertwined with the much larger War of the Roses. Alliances were swapped like crazy and the Hansa was sometimes attacking English shipping, sometimes French, sometimes Burgundian. King Edward IV was actually restored to the crown with the help of ships from Danzig, but soon after that turned against the Hanse. In 1474, this episode of the conflict was over. The Hanse was party to the Peace of Utrecht, which reconfirmed their extensive privileges in England, whilst giving only minimal rights to English traders in the Baltic. But the biggest loser in all of this was Cologne. Because Edward IV had to agree to a boycott of Cologne trade as part of his reconciliation with the Hanse. And that meant the great Rhenish city was completely isolated and cut off from its most important market. In 1474, it had to beg to be readmitted to the Hanse. Now, given all these internal tensions, the question is why did the Hanse kept going? <laughs> 
not just during the 15th, but well into the 16th century. The answer is that despite all of these tensions, the network between the individual merchants remained intact and valuable. The haughty patricians on the city councils may gradually atrophy and turn into landowning aristocrats seeking honour and glory on the battlefield. But the upper middle classes, the merchants like our friend Bernd Pahl, they kept their business relationships with colleagues in the other cities. To a degree, the rising protectionist measures made such networks even more important. If you wanted to trade in Livonia, the restrictions meant that a Lübeck merchant needed a local partner to get around the measures. And maybe Bernd was sent up at the tender age of seven exactly that reason. Plus, the standardization of law and commerce that came in the wake of the Diet of 1418 really removed barriers to trade and was regarded as extremely beneficial to all traders. So, there was still a lot of value in this organization, which is why it persisted. And from the outside, it still looked extremely successful. The Hanse had won two great wars against Eric of Pomerania, the ruler of all of Scandinavia, and then against England. The tensions were hidden under the surface, invisible to the outside. What was more visible, though, was the change in the environment. The rise of the Hanseatic League, that association of merchants of the Holy Roman Empire, had come about at the same time as the disintegration of that self-same Holy Roman Empire. Another kingdom, Denmark, Sweden and Norway, weren't in much better shape. England and France were at each other's throats for a century. But as we head towards the 16th century, these medieval principalities are stabilizing, becoming pre-modern states. And new powers, like Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, appear on the Hanses' doorstep, adding to the tensions inside and between the cities. And that development is what we're going to discuss next week. And I hope you will join us again. Before I go, just one more big, big thank you to all our patrons who have signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans slash support. Your generosity is really, really appreciated. <laughs>